Well, hello and good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Climate Council's webinar, Game On for Glasgow, a snapshot of international action. My name's Leslie Hughes, and I'm your facilitator this evening. I'm an academic at Macquarie University in Sydney, and very, very proud to be a founding councillor at the Climate Council. I'd like to begin this evening's proceedings by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we all meet today. For me, that's the land of the Wallamatagal clan of the Darug Nation here in Sydney. I pay my respect to their elders past, present and emerging and extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples here today. I also invite attendees, as many, as many of you have already done, to include the country that they are joining on today in the chat section. Well, what a day it has been for climate change action, maybe, in Australia. We're just days out from the International Climate Conference, COP26, in Glasgow. We might look back on this meeting in the future as the most important meeting of the century because it will be our most critical opportunity to secure strong climate action across the world. So tonight we're going to be discussing the latest climate science, where international action on climate change is at and what countries have committed to. We'll also be breaking down the Climate Council's latest report from Paris to Glasgow, a world on the move. We'll be explaining how the COP works, what to look out for at COP and beyond. I'd like to thank some of our supporters for already sending in questions. You are very, very organised. Um, and if you have other questions that you think of as we go through tonight, please pop them into the chat and we'll try to get to as many questions as possible at the end of the presentation. So I'm now very glad to introduce our esteemed panelists for the evening. So firstly, Professor Will Steffen, climate science expert, who with me is also a founding councillor at the Climate Council, and he's a researcher at the Australian National University in Canberra. There are frankly very few people, if any, in Australia that know more about climate science than will, and what we also need to do about emissions reductions. Apart from any other qualifications, Will has authored many papers on climate science, most notably about tipping points in the Earth system, and has served as a reviewer on no less than five IPCC reports. In a former life, he was also a fellow Federal Climate Commissioner and served on the panel of experts supporting the multi-party climate change committee under the Gillard government, helping to shape the carbon price policy. Our second panelist is Dr. Simon Bradshaw, the research director for projects at the Climate Council. Simon has been a writer and campaigner on climate action for more than a decade. He's formerly the climate change advocacy lead at Oxfam Australia. Simon is particularly passionate about climate justice and the role of climate action in reducing poverty and inequality. Simon will actually be heading for Glasgow very shortly for COP26, alongside our Chief Councillor, Tim Flannery, and our Communications Specialist, Alex Soderland. So I'd now like to pass over to Simon and Will to share their slides and to give you the presentation, beginning with uh, Will on, on the science update, followed by Simon on all things COP. Over to you, gentlemen. Okay, thank you very much, Leslie. Uh, and first of all, I am coming to you tonight from Ngunnawal country here in Canberra, and I pay my respects uh, to their elders past, present and emerging. I'm going to give a quick overview of the science before handing over to Simon to do most of the work tonight, which uh, obviously and quite appropriately is focused on COP26. So let's uh, jump right in, Simon. So the next slide, please. Uh, my focus is gonna be on the IPCC sixth assessment report. Um, and as you can see on the right-hand side of this slide, this was a major, major effort. 66 countries contributed two rounds of expert uh, review and revision. Uh, 78,000 technical comments were made throughout the review procedure. And having gone through this myself, 
you have to answer every one of those. So it's a big job uh, and it's a very thorough job and you can be absolutely assured uh, that this is the best science uh, that the scientific community can put forward. Uh, and it forms the basis, a scientific basis for the negotiations in Glasgow. Next one, please. Obviously the most critical uh, indicator that we use is global average surface temperature. And you can see on the right-hand panel, the last century and a half or so. And since about uh, 1960 or 70, you can see on that right-hand panel, the very sharp rise in temperature. That rate is actually increasing. Uh, we are sitting now at 1.1 degrees above the, uh, the pre-industrial average. Um, and that's an average temperature for 2011 to 2019. We're actually sitting at 1.2 if you look at where we are today. Uh, the left-hand panel is a 2,000-year record that shows just how remarkable uh, the observed changes, human-driven changes are today. Next slide, please, Simon. So the key findings of the report are uh, the scale and pace, we just talked about that, at which humans are changing the climate system, has almost no precedent in terms of melting ice sheets, we're acidifying the ocean, rainfall is shifting, and so on. The frightening thing I think for me as a scientist is these impacts and climate change itself is accelerating in terms of heat waves, underwater and above ground, fire, storms, et cetera. We have to be aware that worsening impacts are already baked in for a couple of decades at least. Uh, and that's for a couple of reasons. Some is inertia in the climate system, but also inertia in the human system. We can't get emissions to zero tomorrow. For the first time, I think the IPCC gave some prominence to what we call tipping points or catastrophic events, collapses of major ice sheets, rapid temperature uh, spikes. Uh, and as they point out, we need to take account of them in our risk assessment. And as the temperature rises further, these events uh, become more probable. So uh, it, it's an additive incentive that we need to get emissions down fast. Next one. So this is that long-term temperature record of 2000 years. And you can see that natural variability is only about one or two tenths of a degree uh, around a very, very steady long-term average. That spike at the right uh, is the human influence. And that uh, shows how dramatic uh, we have changed the climate system. In fact, when you look at the so-called paleo record, past climate change, there is only one other time in the 4.5 billion year history of Earth that you can see arise this fast. Next slide, please. So the CO2, which is causing this climate change, uh, the, the rate of its increase over the past two decades is about 100 times the maximum rate during the last deglaciation. Uh, the last half century, the temperature is rising at a rate 200 times the background rate. And as I mentioned, these rates of CO2 and temperature rise are almost unprecedented in the entire 4.5 billion year history of the planet. So what we are seeing, in fact, what we are causing is something quite remarkable, even when you go back hundreds, thousands, and millions of years in Earth history. It's quite a dramatic change to the climate system. Next slide, please. So let's look to the future and bring it back down to time scales that matter for us. And so the IPCC has run five so-called scenarios with Earth system models out into the future. You can see this table, uh, and that's the five rows in the table, starting with low emissions, that's 1.9 down to high emissions, 8.5. A couple of points I wanna make. Um, one is that for the near term over the next uh, two decades, as I mentioned, it makes very little difference what's going to happen. It's all 1.5 or 1.6, uh, two decades down the track. Midterm, middle of the century, notice that all emission scenarios, even the lowest are gonna breach 1.5. Uh, so hopefully we can keep it as close to 1.5 as we can, say 1.6. At the end of the century, you'll see the first uh, scenario actually goes back down, and that's because of drawdown of CO2 from the atmosphere. You might ask, where are we headed now? If you actually look at the commitments that countries are taking to Paris, we're aiming for about 2.7. So we have a lot of work to do uh, to increase our ambition, get countries on board, move faster, and move more decisively. Next slide, please. Uh, it's probably just, you know, these are pointing at some of the worst case scenarios if we don't get our act together uh, and uh, we don't wanna go there. So let's really focus on, on moving toward the top part of this diagram. What's happening in Australia? Well, we already know that a lot of things are getting worse. We've experienced bleaching of the Great Barrier Reef, the massive bushfires, extreme heat, coastal erosion. Uh, 
But this, these are the IPCC projections for the future for us. Uh, and this pertains to the next two or three decades. Heat waves will become more frequent and more intense. Uh, marine heat waves will also increase. This is not good news for the GBR. Ocean acidity will also increase as more CO2 is absorbed by the oceans. Fire weather is expected to get worse, uh, more intense, uh, longer, and more frequent fire weather in the, into the future. We have to prepare for that. That's already baked in. Uh, an increase in heavy rainfall in the northern and eastern parts of the country, not too surprising, but interestingly in the central parts of the country as well, but not in the south where many of us live. So that's projected that there will be further increases in droughts in the southern and eastern parts of Australia, but also particularly in the southwest of WA. So these are basically, most of these trends are things that have already set in and they will intensify and worsen over the next couple of decades. For us, sea level is a big issue, uh, given how much infrastructure we have along the coast, how many of us live along the coast, and some of our most vulnerable pe uh, people, for example, in the Torres Strait Islands and along the top end, live along the coast. Our sea levels are rising faster than the global average, and they're pre projected to do that over the next couple uh, of decades, particularly in the north. Uh, and this is going to increase coastal flooding, shoreline retreat, uh, and with storm surges and, and east coast lows it's going to increase damage uh, to infrastructure uh, along the coast. And interestingly, sandstorms and dust storms are also projected to increase throughout Australia, particularly in those areas that are going to uh, experience increasing drought. Next one, Simon. Well, I think the important point now is we know what climate change is doing. We've experienced the impacts. The IPCC has said quite clearly uh, what we have in store. But the really important question, the thing that we really need to discuss in Glasgow is what do we do about this? How do we get on top of this uh, challenge? Globally, it's pretty clear what we need to do. Uh, no new coal, oil, or gas develop developments should be allowed. That's what the science is saying. And I have to emphasize that's also what the peak body in the energy sector is saying. The International Energy Agency has come out and made it unequivocal, saying there is no room for any new coal, oil, or gas developments. And we can contrast that with our um, prime minister's statement earlier today, uh, where he weaseled around uh, the fact that there's going to be a, a lot of proposed new coal and gas developments in this country. Globally, we need to uh, reduce our emissions uh, by half by 2030 or more if we can. And we hit, should hit net zero emissions by 2040, not 2050. We think we can do better here in Australia in, a, in our uh, Aim High Go Fast report that was published uh, earlier this year. Uh, again, we emphasize no new coal, oil, or gas developments uh, here in Australia or anywhere else. We think we can do better than a 50% emission reduction. 75% is what we should aim for. There are more and more people uh, talking about we can do at least 60%. So there's a lot of discussion along the right pathway. By contrast, our prime minister today talked about a 30% emission reduction by 2030, which is pathetically low. Uh, and we should aim for net zero emissions a little bit better than 2040. We should aim for 2035. So this is the challenge that lies ahead of us. This is what we need to do to stabilize um, the Earth system, the climate system, uh, in, in a state that our children and grandchildren can at least survive and hopefully have reasonable lives. But there is now no more time left uh, to get on top of these challenges. We have to meet them now. Next one. So in closing, what's the summary? This is the most important science update for nearly a decade. And it shows that the path we have left to avoid a really catastrophic future is getting very narrow and action is getting very urgent. Only through immediate and sustained emission reduction actions can we get there. And as Simon pointed out, who wrote this wonderful summary, this could be our last warning from the scientific community. Uh, we've already seen the impacts in, uh, here in Australia and around the world, massive flooding in the Indian subcontinent, fires and flooding in Europe, extreme heat in Canada. You, you look at it anywhere around the planet, even at the poles, you see that climate change is already wreaking havoc. Now is the time to make the decisions, and the decisions we make now are going to be the difference maker between what, what my daughter and her generation is going to experience. And here's the last one is point. Every choice we make, every fraction of a degree actually matters. It is really, really important. And the IPCC uh, summarized that exceptionally well. They said, every ton of carbon, a billion ton of carbon that is added, raises the temperature. Every fraction of a degree makes extreme weather worse. So we're now at the end game. 
We've got to get on top of this and we've got to stabilize the climate just as soon as we can. That is the absolutely clear message from the scientific community. So now over to you, Simon. Thank you so much. Well, look, I know I personally, and I'm sure our whole community really appreciate these uh, science updates from you and your ability to put in such clear and compelling terms what's at stake and uh, what we need to be aspiring towards. Uh, I, like Leslie, am joining you from beautiful Darug country, and I want to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging, and also to recognize the crucial leadership role that First Nations are playing in responding to climate change and showing us all how to live sustainably on this beautiful continent again. So as Leslie said, it's been quite the day for anyone uh, who's been following Australian climate politics and climate action or inaction, as I'm sure we all have. So thank you for, for joining us at the end of a long day. I'm gonna be doing two things over the next 15 minutes or so. I'm gonna take you through this new report we've just published, which was really our effort to set the tone, set the expectations for this hugely important moment we're heading to in Glasgow and make clear what Australia needs to deliver. Then after we've done that, I'm going to look a bit more at COP itself, what it is, how it works on the inside, and why this particular meeting, as we've already said, is so very important. But first of all, let's look at some of the key things in this report, which was a real team effort by a lot of our expert counsellors, a lot of my research team, and it's had, a, I think, just the impact we were looking for over the last week in terms of helping set the media narrative. I'm going to start with the positive stuff, because the first thing we wanted to highlight is there has been this really good surge in international action through the last year leading up to COP26. Now, has it been enough? No, it hasn't. I mean, we've still got a long way to go, but there has been momentum there. And I think if you were going to tell me a year ago or any of us that we'd be going into Glasgow with all the world's big developed countries having committed to halve their emissions this decade and all the big burgeoning economies of Asia having pretty much called time on fossil fuels with their net zero commitments, you know, I think we think that was pretty amazing. A long way still to go, but a lot has happened in the last year, and that's given us a lot of reason for hope. It's a bit tough looking at this through Australian eyes, though, because the sad reality is that when Australia put forward its target for 2030 six years ago, it was already at the back of the pack among those comparable nations you can see here in this slide. And then most of those countries, most of those we should be comparing ourselves with, the US, the Europeans, the UK, Japan, Canada, they've nearly all now significantly strengthened their actions for this decade, are collectively committed to roughly half emissions uh, by 2030. Again, they, like all countries, are going to have to go further, but that's been a big change. Unfortunately, we've been left even further behind as this has happened. But it's not just those new targets. We've also seen climate change move, move right to the center of global geopolitics and power plays and security concerns. Obviously, the election of the Biden administration was the really big game changer here. But elsewhere as well, we've seen climate change put right at the heart of the foreign policy and trade policy of some of the world's really big powers. So that's the good stuff. There's been change, there's been momentum, and that's gonna keep building through Glasgow and beyond. And unfortunately, what we have to do is a bit of a reality check on where Australia is currently standing. And one of the things we did in the report, the bit that's got us the most attention, attention is uh, Tim Baxter, who's uh, in our research team and is very, very good at emissions data and number crunching and so on. He put together our own uh, uh, index uh, to show how Australia was really comparing alongside other countries. Now, we look specifically at the group of advanced economies, those that have the same responsibilities as we have under the Paris Agreements. And we looked both at new pledges and commitments that countries have made, but importantly, we also looked at countries' track record in reducing emissions or not over the last little while. The sad reality is that we're at the bottom. We're, we're dead last at the moment in what I suspect we all feel is the most important uh, race humanity has ever faced. It doesn't have to be that way, as I'm sure you all know, we're sitting on some of the world's best renewable energy potential. We've got incredible opportunities to not just survive, but to really uh, prosper as the world moves beyond fossil fuels. And we'll, we'll get to more of that later. But right now, we're sitting right at the back of the pack. And just to explain a bit more why, this is the probably the most complicated slide I've got here. So just bear with me a moment. You're probably uh, familiar with hearing our government say we're going to meet and beat our current target. Now, there's two things we've got to keep in mind there. The first is that 
that target we set ourselves six years ago was already so much out of whack when it came to the science of climate change and the available global carbon budgets. It put us right at the back among other developed countries. And so even meeting that target is really nothing to shout about because we need to be greatly strengthening that target. The other thing for us to realize is that almost all the achievement, if you can call it that, has come from reduction in uh, land use through, sorry, reduction in land clearing and other changes in land use. Now, of course, that's important. We need to be halting land clearing. We need to be locking more carbon up in the soil as part of uh, responding to climate change. But that bit of progress we've made there has kind of masked the fact that we've made almost zero progress across the sectors that really matter in our electricity, in our, in our transports, uh, in our industrial sectors. So if you actually look at our sources of emissions and our efforts to stop emissions at their source and move beyond the fossil, fossil fuels, we've made next to no progress over the last three decades. In fact, our emissions have been trending steadily upwards. That's the yellow line you see there on the graph except for a recent dip due to COVID-19 and a, another dip just a few years ago um, during the brief operation of the carbon price in Australia. So that's our reality. That's uh, what a decade or two decades of squandered opportunity in Australia has looked like. And that's why for now, we're right at that back, right at the back of the pack amongst our peers. And of course, we and all of you are gonna be doing everything we can to, to change that. Just a couple more things to unpack the report. Um, we are, I want to say we, Australia, is under unprecedented international pressure at the moment to strengthen its climate commitments. For the first time, we've got the, the US under the new US administration, the UK, uh, the other Europeans, some of our biggest trading partners, all calling very explicitly publicly for Australia to up its game, specifically to lift its 2030 target. Of course, we've got very strong calls from the region, from the Pacific, as we have for many years. But this is really the first time that Australia has been copying it from all those directions at once. Everybody pounding on us to say, come on, you've got to do better. You've got to lift, up, lift your 2030 target. And of course, alongside that, we've got this domestic pressure as well, where not just a majority of the Australian public now, a clear majority, I wanted to see stronger action, but you've got people like the, the Business Council of Australia calling for a 50% reduction this decade. So a lot going on there that, of course, we need to keep harnessing. And um, there's a quote here from Prime Minister Frank Benamarama of Fiji, who was kind enough to uh, write a forward for this report, which I think sums up the sentiment from a lot of our uh, neighbours and our partners around the world. By the time leaders come to Glasgow and COP26, COP it should be with immediate and transformative actions come with new commitments for serious cuts in emissions by 2030, 50% or more, come with commitments to be, become net zero before 2050, do not come with excuses that time has passed. You can see that focus straight away on action this decade. Again, just ending on the positives, because we should never let anyone tell us that what Australia does doesn't make a difference in the international scheme of things. Because the truth is we're an absolute giant of the global carbon economy. We're a big emitter in our own right. We're the world's largest exporter of liquefied gas, the second largest exporter of thermal coal. We are a huge part of the problem, but with that, we can be a huge part of the solution because we're sitting on such opportunity here to not only be decarbonizing our own energy system, but helping drive decarbonization globally if we just start tapping into our natural advantage. So I'm getting now here into the key recommendations from this report. The first one, as Will's touched on already, is that Australia should be aiming to reduce its emissions by 75% below 2005 levels by 2030 and achieve net zero by 2035. That's what the science compels. And we've been very clear with that line, I think, all this year. We've also said that as a first step, and just a first step, going into Glasgow, the minimum we should do to be catching up with our peers is to at least match those updated commitments from our allies, including the US and the UK, and go to Glasgow with a commitment to at least halve our national emissions this decade. Of course, to do that means we need a comprehensive economy-wide plan to be decarbonizing our electricity and transport sectors, industrial sectors, protecting and restoring our ecosystems. Importantly, supporting communities that are transforming out of the industries of the past into these uh, new industries of the future. 
And the other point that we put in here, the other recommendation rather, which is not something that gets much attention outside of these international negotiations, it doesn't get much of a look in in our domestic politics, but as a wealthy country, we've got this crucial other responsibility of supporting uh, less developed or poorer countries with their climate action plans, with building the clean economies of the future, with adapting to the impacts that can no longer be avoided. And the US, sorry, Australia is very much lagging other countries, including the US, and the amount of money it's currently putting forward to support climate action beyond our shores. And as a minimum, if we're to catch up with our peers, we need to be doubling our contribution to support uh, climate action in developing countries. And that's as a contribution to a long-standing goal of over a decade to collectively be providing $100 billion a year by 2020. Now, just finally, before we take a bit of a look at COP itself, what to expect over the next couple of weeks. We can't make this point enough, and I think this has been the focus of so much of Climate Council's work, um, enabled by all of you over the last uh, several years, is the opportunity here that Australia is sitting on. And the fact that if we have a commitment and a plan for rapidly cutting our emissions this decade, that's going to unlock new investments, all these billions of dollars that are waiting in the wings. It's going to create new jobs. And the best thing of all is it's particularly going to help create new jobs in some of those same regions that have <coughs> traditionally depended on fossil fuels. And there's some great new research by some of our allies, including Beyond Zero Emissions and a big report put out by ACF and the ACTU and I think the Business Council as well last week that starts to show just how big this opportunity is. And we actually have potential for clean export industries that would far exceed the value of our current fossil fuel exports. And that you know, brings new jobs, not only in renewable energy and energy efficiency, but also in advanced manufacturing, including the manufacture of green steel, steel produced without some um, carbon emissions for which there's gonna be enormous demands all around the world. We're also sitting on these uh, vast reserves of lithium, cobalt and the minerals needed to power the world's clean energy transition. And so there's all these uh, benefits that come, but we need that national leadership if we're to see these opportunities really start to be unlocked and all the investment to flow in and all these great opportunities to be realized. And of course, acting on climate change brings so many co-benefits for Australians and communities everywhere. We are talking ultimately about making a self health, safer, healthier environment for Australians and communities everywhere. And because of that status we have as a big emitter, a big explorer of fossil fuels, poised to be a big exporter of clean energy as well, we really can be a big part of the solution. All right, so that's everything that was in our our new report last week, and uh, which was really there to set expectations ahead of COP and really drive home the message of what Australia can be if we actually start being our best and then show up with commitments that reflect the will of Australians and the advantages that we have in the scheme of things. <coughs> I'm now just going to say a little bit about this uh, very important moment that we're heading into. What is COP26? Why it matters? Um, and just to give you a bit of an insight into the workings of these, these big summits as well. Now, I'm not going to give a whole history lesson on the 30 plus years of international negotiations, but crikey, it's interesting to think that there really is three decades worth of negotiations uh, leading up to Glasgow, which means that for some of you on the call, this has probably been going on for your entire life. But I do just want to give a bit of the backstory so we understand what's led us to this point. It really goes back to the early 1990s and the adoption of the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. That was the foundation on which all international cooperation on climate change has been built. In fact, just prior to the UN Framework Convention was the first uh, IPCC, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Assessment, which Will was involved in. Um, and that kind of was the beginnings of the sort of global consensus on the reality of the climate crisis and the fact we needed to act. So then you had this UN Framework Convention, and then in 1995, you had the very first COP, which began negotiations on what became the Kyoto Protocol. That was the first uh, binding instrument for reducing greenhouse gas, gas emissions. It only applied to a select group of um, wealthier countries. So fairly soon after that, you had the beginnings of efforts to land a truly global universal uh, agreement that um, involved commitments for, from all countries. 
2009 in Copenhagen, which some of you may remember, and now I have some colleagues who don't seem to have ever quite recovered from Copenhagen because that's where there was great hopes there that we would arrive at this universal agreement. Things obviously fell short. There were some foundations there laid for what was to come later. And things trucked on then until we got to 2015. And then finally, after an exhaustive process over many years, the world arrived at the Paris Agreement. Um, and that really is the crowning achievement of this long protracted process of negotiations. That was when the world committed all countries to limiting warming to well below two degrees and to aim as close as possible at 1.5 degrees, knowing that warming beyond that limit was going to become very, very dangerous. And then everything since 2015, COP21 in Paris and the Paris Agreement has been about implementing the Paris Agreement, about fulfilling that promise, about agreeing the rules, about ratcheting up the commitments. And I'm going to explain in a moment why this moment now is so crucial why there's so much expectation on Glasgow when it comes to finally fulfilling that promise of the Paris Agreement. But before we come to that, I'm just going to talk a little bit about how COP works. Now, this is probably going to be interesting to the nerds amongst you, a little less so to, um, to others. Um, so I'm going to race through this rather quick. But it really is quite a fascinating process. The first thing to recognize is there's a lot of different elements here. It's a hugely complicated negotiation. The Paris Agreement commits us to that global temperature goal, but it provides a framework for action across all these different pillars of responding to climate change. And so in Glasgow, there's going to be at any one time, perhaps 20 different negotiating streams going on as the different aspects of the rules of the agreement, the commitments that countries need to fulfill are being nutted out. The main game, always the most important part is what in climate parlance is called mitigation. That's actually reducing emissions stopping the problem at its source. The key thing for Glasgow is going to be keeping alive that temperature goal of the Paris Agreement through strengthening emissions this decade. But then alongside that, you've got these various other elements. You've got the whole <clears throat> process of adapting to the impacts of climate change. Those impacts that due to past inaction uh, can no longer be avoided. And we've got to build our resilience too. And so countries will be bringing together new commitments on that front. You've then in recent years had, and again, due to past inaction, the necessity of a whole other area of negotiations, which is particularly important to many of our Pacific friends, which is about how you address the loss and damage, the permanent loss and damage from climate change through um, additional financial and technical support or compensation or whatever else. So you've got these main pillars and then underlying all that is the sort of glue or oil, sorry, that keeps it all turning is finance, is fulfilling that uh, commitment to provide adequate finance where it's needed to uh, be supporting the various actions, the finance or means of implementation as it's sometimes called. And then you've got all these other little areas as well and bring the rules for the international trade in emissions reductions, the rules by which countries are going to report on their emissions reductions, that's that transparency element, and then provisions to um, help countries with less resources build their capacity to respond. So all this is looked at at once, and at the end of Glasgow, at the end of any COP, countries will finally arrive at a series of decisions across all these elements, which then sets the course for the next phase of international cooperation. And this slide here, when we talk about the process, how these negotiations unfold, how we arrive at decisions, this is a very simplified view of some of the key negotiating blocks. These countries will group themselves into blocks of like-minded countries, and they will negotiate as part of those groups. And over the years, you've had these sort of groups form and solidify. So for example, you've got the, the European Union, which is generally at the more progressive end of the developed countries. Uh, you've then got um, this big orange oval, which is the group of 77 plus China. That's basically the entire developing world. And within that, you've then got some specific groups, the Alliance of Small Island States, including the Pacific uh, uh, island states, which is uh, small in population, but really important part of these negotiations, not just because of the moral authority they bring, but some very skillful diplomacy over many years by the Pacific. It's an African group, then you've got your big emerging economies, uh, Brazil, South Africa, India, China. And every morning, these groups will be clubbing together, working out um, what they're going to do in the day's negotiations and so forth. And you're probably thinking, where does Australia fit in this? We're actually part of this um, motley crew of countries called the Umbrella Group, which includes ourselves, 
the US, Saudi Arabia, Russia, New Zealand, Japan, one or two others. In the past, and especially through the Trump years, Australia kind of kept its head in because it would have the US really do its dirty work for it. What we're going to find in Glasgow is Australia is much more isolated now because it's now pretty much the only country that's still dragging its heels when it comes to 2030 targets and other key asks. So as I'm just going to close out within a minute, there's a lot of intense scrutiny that Australia is going to be coming under. And so a lot of opportunity for us really to be um, pushing hard for stronger commitments. So we're going to leave that um, little whistle stop tour on what happens in COP and uh, the various dynamics and just end with why to reinforce one more time, this COP matters so much. Why Climate Council, with all of your support, has been putting so much effort into it. Well, this quote from Alok Sharma, who's the UK minister who's been assigned as president of COP26, I think it sums it up pretty well. Paris promised Glasgow must deliver. Because the Paris Agreement, it gave us that framework for action. It set the goal of limiting warming to well below two degrees, pursuing efforts towards 1.5 degrees. But the way it works is that individual countries, they come up with their own contributions, nationally determined contributions to that goal. And the sum of those contributions, those emissions reduction targets, was just way short of what it needed to be, no more so than in the case of Australia. But governments anticipated that, and so they built into the agreements a five-year cycle of ratcheting up those commitments. And so we've reached the deadline at the end of that first five years. And COP26 is all about stepping up actions for the next decade, closing the gap between what the science demands, where countries are currently at, and particularly that means strengthening commitments for this coming decade through the 2020s, bring them into line with what the science demands. There's a couple of other things at play as well. And these are the headline goals that they've been set out by the, by the UK. Mitigation, so reducing emissions, securing global net zero and keeping 1.5 within reach. So all about 2030 targets. That's where Australia is still sticking out like a sore thumb. The only advanced economy pretty much that does not substantially strengthen its 2030 emissions reduction targets. To mention there'll be uh, decisions and um, new commitments set around adaptation. Australia will have something to say there, but it's important that commitments made towards adaptation don't take any heat off the need for stronger emissions reductions because at the moment, if everyone was to follow Australia's lead, we'd be heading for a world that just can't be adapted to. Mobilizing the finance to make it all happen. You'll see a lot of talk over the next couple of weeks about fulfilling this $100 billion commitment. Australia's got to up its contribution if it's to be giving a fair, fair share there. And then there'll be lots of other collaboration, lots of other deals and alliances formed. We know that the UK is really intent on this COP being seen as the end of COP, among other things. So they'll be enlisting many more countries to this, to what's called the Powering Pass Coal Alliance. There'll be attempts to get a decision to end the international financing of coal. Uh, there's also a new alliance called Beyond Oil and Gas, which of course is looking to expedite the phase out of um, oil and gas as well. There'll be a new pledge, a global pledge to be reducing methane emissions Methane being responsible for around a third of the warming we've seen so far. And one of the most effective things we can do in the short term is rein in methane emissions. And Australia is going to find itself in the crosshairs of a lot of this and a lot of pressure to not only be upping our 2030 target, but to be getting on board with these collaborations as well. So what are we going to be doing? Um, well, Tim Flannery, who will be well known to all of you, he's going to be on the grounds in Glasgow. Uh, Alex Sutherland, who is one of our comms wizards, is going to be there as well, helping send back some amazing content all throughout the two weeks. I'm very privileged to be there myself as part of the team. So there's a whole range of things we've got planned. Uh, we'll be sending back content uh, daily via blogs, social media posts, uh, videos, and so forth. Of course, we'll be meeting with Australian officials and negotiators over there to to take our case and, and all of your case to the Australian government on how they need to be stepping up. We'll be talking to the media to bring visibility and accountability to what's going on. There'll be email updates from us at the starts and in the middle at the end. I think we're planning another one of these webinars shortly after the close of COP26 to give you the skinny on what happens. And um, I know you've been receiving various bits of content already from our amazing digital and community teams to try and unpack a bit more about 
things like today's announcement from the government, which I'm sure we'll talk about in questions, as well as what to expect in Glasgow and beyond. So lots of stuff uh, coming your way over the next couple of weeks. And if you're not already following on these various channels, this is where you can really be joining the conversation, be part of what we're trying to do on the ground. And um, of course, many of you do interact with us through these various ways already. And I think this is very much a team effort from all of us to be bringing as much uh, pressure onto our government to step up as we can. So um, I look forward to you being part of the conversation over the next couple of weeks. And just finally, it doesn't end with Glasgow. This is a hugely important moment, perhaps the most important uh, meeting of, of many of our lifetimes, but we're already thinking about the post-Glasgow game, how we keep up the momentum and the pressure. We know, unfortunately, that Glasgow probably isn't going to get us all the way to being on a path to limiting warming to 1.5 degrees. We've seen a lot of momentum going in there, a lot of new commitments, but after Glasgow, it's going to be about further ratcheting things up through the 2020s. So Glasgow will end with a decision that commits, we hope, commits countries to further strengthening those 2030 targets over the coming years. That pressure on Australia from the rest of the world is only going to build. We've got to harness that as best we can. We'll, of course, be going into our Australian summer, which, as we all know, can bring its many challenges with extreme weather. And so we'll be preparing to respond to those and make sure that every time we are faced with one of these brute realities of climate change, we are using that to, to call on our decision makers to be getting with the program and committing to stronger action. As we go into next year, of course, we're in the context of a federal election and uh, we'll be carrying all that momentum from Glasgow to make sure that uh, Australia's decision makers are stepping up on all sides with strong commitments and making sure we really do play our part through the next decades and um, get on board with tackling global climate change. So that's it. Um, thank you again, Will, for the science. And uh, there you go, a bit of an insight into what's in our report, what to expect at COP. I think it's time for me to stop talking and for us to answer some of your questions. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Simon and Will, for that lightning um, but extremely informative presentation. Well, the questions have been rolling in, in both the chat and the Q&A. Uh, we're going to try and get to as many as we can. Um, I apologise in advance that we won't get to all of them because there's uh, an awful lot, but that shows the level of interest. So I'm going to start with a few to Will about emissions reduction. So firstly, Will, a question from Michael. Um, what are Australia's 23rd? 2030 reductions, how were they calculated and what should they be? So this has already been covered a little bit in our aim high go fast, but I mean, did the government at Paris just pull those numbers out of the air? How did they come up with them? Well, that's a really good question because the 26 to 28 percent emission reduction uh, by 2030, which is still our official 2030 target, uh, came during the Tony Abbott era. Uh, and there was absolutely no, no um, objective research that stood behind that. What he did is he copied the USA, um, which was a 26 to 28% reduction, but by 2025. And uh, Tony and his mates cleverly pushed that out to 2030 uh, and tried to look like we would do as much as the US, which was absolute rubbish. And unfortunately, uh, since those days, that's sort of been entrenched as our extremely inadequate and uh, totally unverifiable uh, climate target. Thanks, Will. So that, that segues nicely into my next question, which was raised by um, John, I think, is that why do all the countries provide emissions reduction targets based on different baselines? What, what is, why is that? I can tell you my cynical view is they will choose the baseline that gives them uh, the most bang for the buck. In other words, the, the highest looking reduction in terms of percentage, but the least amount they actually have to do on the ground. And, and as Simon pointed out very well, uh, we like to use 2005 because our land use emissions were peaking around then. Uh, so we get a lot of free kicks, so to speak, down the pitch uh, simply by reducing land clearing, which was going to happen anyway. Other countries use other techniques like that uh, to put themselves in the best possible light. Of course, you can't fool the atmosphere. That actually is what matters in the end. So, Will, a couple more for you before I move to Simon then. So, 
You know, the Climate Council really emphasises it's the 2030 targets that count. But can you explain in simple terms to our audience why, what it is about 2030 that is very different from 2050? Yeah, look, I, I think the, the techniques that I use to um, judge what we need to do to meet a temperature uh, goal is what's called a carbon budget. That's the cumulative amount of emissions uh, that we can emit globally, and then you can divvy it up to countries uh, before you uh, are going to breach that target. Uh, and so when you look at how much we've emitted already uh, through 2021, and what we can emit to have a reasonable chance at 1.5, uh, you find, first of all, uh, you can't do that without breaching 1.5 and then drawing it back down, but you can still get well below two. But when you look at how little carbon we can emit to do that, that means what we emit between now and 2025 and 2030 is crucial. Because if we do not get emissions down fast by 2030, the budget's gone. You can fiddle around all you want with 2050, but you're not going to meet the Paris climate goals. And that's because we have left it so late that we have chewed up so much of the overall budget that we are now on a really tight budget and we just have to get uh, to, to, we have to get our emissions down at least by half by 2030 or else there's virtually no budget left uh, for the Paris climate goals. So Will, that segues into my last question for now for you, which is uh, from Anne. So after net zero is achieved, so Anne's being very, very optimistic that that will be achieved, of course. Mm. What's next? What amount of carbon emissions do we need to actually remove from the atmosphere to stay under a warming or bring back to 1.5 or below if we overshoot that target? That's a really good question. And if you look at the IPCC AR6, the emission trajectories, the one that does get back down to 1.4 has sustained drawdown from mid-century out to 2100 and probably uh, a little bit beyond that. And you're looking at fairly substantial amounts like five to 10 billion tons of CO2 a year. This is not trivial. Uh, and there are basically two approaches. One is to help, you know, let, let the biosphere uh, do its job, you know, quit, quit destroying the biosphere and allow it to take up carbon, which it can do very well. The other is an industrial process called carbon capture and storage, um, which is, um, it's been around as a concept for 30 years. I remember what it was the next big thing coming out in the 1990s. And basically we've achieved bugger all in, make, in, in getting it to uh, a commercial state. It's extremely difficult technologically. It's very expensive. And quite frankly, it's much, much cheaper just to reduce emissions really fast than it is to bugger around with trying to get CO2 out of the atmosphere. <clears throat> Thanks, Will. I'll give you a little rest now and okay. go to Simon. So Simon, the first question is from me, actually. Given the amount of attention, especially in Australia, but elsewhere as well, on Glasgow, could you say that the Glasgow COP has already been a success to an extent? Well, I think we have seen a lot of progress in the last year, haven't we? And um, more than perhaps I'd anticipated, pro probably many of us. Uh, and that's been in spite of this big disruption through coronavirus. I mean, maybe to some extent because of it, because um, a lot of countries have used that opportunity where they've had to really do huge amounts of public investment in their economies to actually kickstart a lot of climate solutions. Um, Australia, for some unfathomable reason, decided that gas by recovery was the smart choice. But um, we can come back to that. So. Uh, it's, it's definitely catalyzed a lot of good stuff already, but it's not enough. And I think, you know, as Will has made so very clear, um, there's a huge amount still at stake. Uh, the latest assessments of the sum of all of those national contributions, it still has us on that path to 2.7 degrees of warming, as Will's explained very well to us over many years. I mean, that's a level of warming that gets us into all sorts of difficulties with transgressing tipping points in the climate system and uh, creating conditions that's certainly not compatible with well-functioning human societies. So I think it's been successful and already in encouraging that momentum. Some of that's driven just by the real world economics of renewable energy as well. I mean, there's a lot of wind in the sails now, but a lot is still gonna happen over the next few weeks for it really to be seen as a success. We need more countries, especially ourselves, coming forward with stronger commitments. And we will see some new announcements, especially in those first couple of days when 125, I think, world leaders are going to be in there. They'll be bringing new things to put on the table. Crucially, Glasgow's got to end with what the uh, wonks are calling an ambition signal. In other words, the decision to immediately keep ratcheting up through the 2020s. There's a push from the Climate Vulnerable Forum, which is a group of some of the most 
vulnerable developing countries for that to happen yearly for each successive COP to require further increases in 2030 commitments. So I think, yes, it's really helped create this surge in international momentum, but so much to do. We've got to see more action this decade. We've got to see Glasgow slingshot us into a truly transformative next 10 years where we see a lot of change. So Simon, uh, this is a question from Susan. Just how effective are the commitments that countries sign up to? How are they enforced? How are they held accountable and measured? So we don't have a global climate policeman. Uh, how are commitments to something, an inter, any international agreement actually enforced or not? Well, first of all, there's very strict rules around the accounting and reporting of emissions. So it's always visible, the progress that countries are making or are not making. And yes, there's no global climate policeman. There's no sort of legal enforcement of these commitments. But we're going to see some pretty punitive measures, I think, for those countries that, like ourselves, that aren't stepping up. Now, the Europeans, the U European Union is putting in place a carbon border adjustment mechanism to actually put an additional price on, on imports that have come from places that are not taking action on climate change, don't have their own carbon price. So we are moving into a phase where it's not just about diplomatic peer pressure, and Australia's been copying a lot of that from all sides. There's actually going to be some about real economic and trade coercion from those countries that have had a gut full of those who aren't sort of um, who aren't playing their part. So th there's a range of measures like that, and I think um, the consequences for Australia and any laggard of not stepping up, not putting forward more ambitious commitments, and going through with them are about to get, I think, very much more real than perhaps they have in the past. So. You've sort of answered this question already, Simon, just then, but from um, Jean-Paul, what will be the international reaction to Scott Morrison, for example, turning up in Glasgow saying, oh, we're doing net zero by 2050, but nothing else? What, what, mm -hmm. what do you think, you know, and will the Australian government actually respond any further to that international pressure, do you think? Look, I've got to say, having a... Uh for my sins, been to a few of these events and uh, other big climate conferences. I have seen a pattern whereby Australia shows up thinking it's got something great, thinking it's going to get a lot of kudos and realising it just hasn't read the room <laughs> and it gets smacked down. And, um, you know, that's zero by 2050 is, I mean, it's really last year's story, if we're to be blunt. I mean, we're, it's so overdue, Australia committing to what really is just the most basic entry ticket to Glasgow, really. All the signals we see from the UK as the COP hosts, from a, a very proactive Biden administration and others, is it's got to be about 2030. It's got to be about this decade. And I've not seen over the many years been watching us getting such explicit and firm public pressure on, on just this very point. And I don't see that abating when we get to Glasgow. You know, I think um, you know, we are going to, uh, I, I think showing up just with what was announced today, I know we haven't had much of a chance to unpack it, but, you know, it's pretty meaningless without stronger cuts this decade, without a commitment to move beyond coal and gas. It's not enough. It's not what the science demands. It's not what the rest of the world is calling on us to do. So it's going to be quite uncomfortable being in Glasgow as an Australian if we don't have more to show up with than that. But I think encouragingly, for those of us in Australia who care so much about this, we will be able to come out of Glasgow bring all that pressure with us into a crucial year and an election next year and, and keep working for Australia to step up over this decade. So Simon, speaking of uncomfortable, and this is an insider COP attendee question about the Fossil of the Day Award, which I know that you will know all about, but would you like to briefly explain to our audience what the Fossil of the Day actually is awarded for and how many of these might Australia ex expect to be awarded over the two week period? This is a question from John. Thank you, John. <laughs> Great <laughs> question. So um, look, in that little snapshot I gave the negotiation before, I talked about you know, what goes on between governments, but crucially, there's the whole civil society participation around it. They, they call us observers, but you know, we, we do more than observe. We're very proactive in the process. And um, you know, NGOs have got very creative over the years in how they hold governments to account, how they shine a light on the bad stuff as well as the good stuff. And the fossil of the day is one of the tools that's been used to really good effect. And it's basically an award that's given out every day to whichever country 
is doing its most, doing the most to obstruct process in critical areas of the negotiations, or which has just been showing up with the most abysmal commitments. I don't know, Leslie, how many of these we've had in total. I do know the last COP I was at, we had the even more dubious honor of receiving the colossal fossil, which is the grand award at the end of the negotiations for who had the most fossils. Um, look, I think it's, um, it's, it's a bit of fun. It's an important tool, I think, in the shining the light on these things. And it's, there's a critical role we have to play there in holding our government to account. And ultimately, it's all about doing what we can to, you know, just to push for us to be better and to be not holding up things up, dragging our heels, but actually playing our part in, uh, by not just getting our emissions in order here in Australia, but really playing a constructive role in these negotiations. Because the other thing I'd say is uh, the cop insider, <laughs> Leslie, is that we've seen moments where Australia really has, you know, um, done the right thing and helped everyone move together. And famously in Bali in 2007, when Australia finally signed up to the Kyoto Protocol. I mean, that might have only been a modest step, but you could see how that emboldened other countries to then keep going, to move together because you know, one of the real blocks on progress was finally with the program. And we're going into this COP in a similar situation as this almost the only holdout on 2030 targets. And I can guarantee if we showed up and said, hey, we're going to halve our emissions this decade as well, then that would completely flip our role in these negotiations around. Of course, it's not enough, but, you know, we'd no longer be dragging the whole world down. We'd actually be making a positive and outside contribution. So then we'd be getting the ray of the day. That's the other award they get given. Thanks, Simon. Um, Will, I can give you about 30 seconds now for our last um, comment. What would you regard as a success, successful COP? How would you define that? Look, I, I think if we get uh, some real action toward uh, 2030 targets, I would like to see a handful of countries doing better than 50% reduction. UK is already doing that. Um, as, as Simon said, somehow, some way, I would like to see our government doing about face. I'm not holding my breath, mind you, uh, but, but uh, join that 50% uh, reduction by 2030. Uh, but more than that, I think I'd like to see cooperation on technologies. I'd like to see money going to developing countries to help them. And I would like to see a spirit that was the opposite of the spirit of the only cop I've been to, which was Copenhagen, which fell apart at the end. The best thing is we, if we come out of this uh, as a more um, unified species that we need to save our own planet. That's what I'd like to see. Thank you so much, Simon and Will. Um, and my apologies to all of those people who sent in questions that we didn't get time to, to go for. Um, it's a, a measure of your interest as to how many we got. So I'd like to thank you all for watching, for sending along those questions for your support. The Climate Council, of course, is publicly funded and we wouldn't exist without all of your support. Um, this recording will be available. The slides, I think, will also be available. So um, please spread the word wide. Um, and we hope that you will join us um, for watching all the live streams and blogs and things that will come out of the COP. Stay with us, we're with you um, onwards and upwards. Thanks so much for this evening. Um, wish our COP attendees all the very best and hopefully we'll meet again very soon afterwards. Thank you. <laughs>